Welcome, everyone. We're about to get started. My name is Alex Weiser. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. Welcome to everyone tonight. We're very happy to have you with us. So YIVO was founded in 1925 as a place to study and to preserve Jewish history, language, and culture. And it grew to be something of a Jewish Library of Congress. And so at, at the core of YIVO is its archival and library collections, which contain over 23 million documents and over 400,000 books. So YIVO does various programs to bring these uh, collections to life, Pro public programs like we have tonight, education classes, um, online classes, all sorts of initiatives. Tonight's program is particularly close to our heart because YIVO contains the archive of the Jewish Labor Bund. And I won't say too much more because you're going to hear from very esteemed people on this topic momentarily. Um, but first, we're going to, I'm going to invite up Spencer Sunshine. Spencer Sunshine was the co-organizer of our Yiddish Anarchism Conference, which perhaps many of you knew, which we did last January. I've got the brochure here. And actually, you can watch this entire conference on our YouTube channel with really beautiful edited videos. Um, so check this out if you're curious. Um, and Spencer was instrumental in organizing tonight's event. His PhD dissertation, Post-1960 U.S. Anarchism and Social Theory, addresses the ontological and epistemological implications of the transition from classical to contemporary anarchism. For the last several years, he's been engaged in counter far-right research and activism, focusing on unorthodox fascists, the alt-right, and anti-Semites. You can follow him on Twitter at Transform 6789. Please welcome Spencer Sunshine. So as Alex mentioned, this is the second event I've helped produce here at EVO, um, the first being the January Anarchist Symposium, uh, which I suspect a number of people here attended. Uh, but for this panel, Evo and I spent some time trying to figure it out. We were trying to get people who are both great speakers, but also who represented the different ways uh, that Bundism has influenced people today. So tonight's panel varies in age, gender, political lineage, proximity to the academy, and the kind of cultural and political work uh, that the speakers are engaged in. We also struggled with what we were going to do with the panel. Was this a debate? Was this an academic presentation? A survey of activism? Or an intergenerational dialogue? And so while we knew the panel would wrangle with Jewish identity, we didn't know if it was about secularism, Zionism, language, or the left. Over the years, the Bund and the projects that have come out of it have been many different things to many different people in many different places. And today, the Bund is looked to by those on the left who want a link to the thriving pre-war Eastern European Ashkenazi culture, a different way to approach minority representation, an inspiration for cultural work from sports clubs to Yiddish studies, as well as programs for children and youth, and it is also a venerable ancestor for Jewish union organizers and anti-fascist activists who support armed self-defense. But none of these specific reasons are why Bundism is so controversial, nor why it is attracting the attention of young people. Today, many believe that Israel will never accept a two-state solution. And whether this belief is right or wrong, for many left-leaning Jews, it has significantly decreased Israel as being central to their identity. This trend is undeniably visible for those who are under 40, and many of them are looking to Bundism for a different approach. So this creates tension, uh, not just between the Zionist mainstream of or the organized Jewish community and the Bundists, but also within Bundism itself. So on one hand, there's a group that are sometimes called neo-Bundists, uh, these are leftists, mostly but not all under 40, who have encountered the Bund's ideas largely by reading about them and combining them with their existing political traditions. The other branch is what I call organizational Bundism, 
And from my perspective, these are people who have mostly been initiated into the Bundist tradition through their family ties or through participation in either the original Bund itself or projects which came directly out of it. And so this panel seeks to shed light on a form of Jewish politics which, instead of passing from the stage of history as expected, is growing in influence today. And today's Bundism struggles with questions that affect the diaspora Jewish community as a whole, and especially in the United States. And these questions include, how can we be sure that the Eastern European Ashkenazi traditions remain alive in the diaspora? What's the best way to do this, being sensitive to the fact that diaspora Jewish communities consist of people of a diversity of different backgrounds? What are the state of different Jewish languages today? And what should a specifically Jewish left look like and be interested in? And so whether you love or hate the answers that are going to be given today, uh, these questions are going to be relevant to the Jewish community for the foreseeable future. So I'm very much looking forward to this panel, and I hope you are too. I'm going to introduce um, our moderator, uh, Jack Jacobs. He is a professor of political science at John Jay College and at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, also my alma mater. He is the author of On Socialists and the Jewish Question After Marx, Bundes Counterculture in Interwar Poland, and the Frankfurt School, Jewish Lives and Antisemitism. He's also the editor of Jewish Politics in Eastern Europe, The Bund at 100, and Jews and Leftist Politics. Uh, Judaism, Israel, Antisemitism, and Gender. He served as a Fulbright Fellow at Tel Aviv University in 1996 and 1997, as a Fulbright Fellow at the Vilnius Yiddish Institute in 2009, as Podnos Visiting Professor at the University of Michigan in 2016, and as a Visiting Fellow at the British Academy in 2018. Please welcome Jack Jacobs. My thanks, first of all, to the Evo for putting this together, and my thanks for that lovely introduction. In the few minutes available to me this evening, I hope to raise several questions, or sets of questions. First of all, what was the Bund, and what did it accomplish? And secondly, what was the Bund's ideology, and in what ways was that ideology distinctive? And then, thirdly, are there components of the Bundist legacy which resonate with contemporary activists? And if so, which are the components which remain relevant today? I'll try to answer the first two questions in my introductory remarks, and I'm hoping that the third group of questions will be answered primarily by the other speakers on this panel over the course of our event. So here goes. The Jewish Workers Bund, which was founded as an illegal underground organization in the Tsarist Empire in 1897, grew very dramatically in the years immediately after its creation. It helped to organize the Russian Social Democratic Workers Party. It organized armed self-defense groups to fight against pogroms. And it played a prominent role in the Russian Revolution of 1905. The Bund rejected Lenin's organizational outlook and his stance towards the national question from a very early day onward. While the Bund demanded that the Russian Social Democrats allow the Bund to function throughout Russia and that the Bund be recognized as the sole representative of the Jewish proletariat, Lenin rejected both of the Bund's demands out of hand. But as a result of maneuvers which stacked the decks against the Bund, the Bund lost on both of these issues at a pivotal Congress of the Russian Social Democrats, thereby presaging the loss the Bund would ultimately suffer in Russia in the wake of the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. Bundists played leading roles in Russian political affairs in the period immediately following the overthrow of the Tsar. However, like socialist parties around the world, the Bund ultimately split over the question of its relationship 
to Bolshevism. At the 12th Conference of the Bund held in Moscow in 1920, a majority of the delegates voted in favor of a resolution endorsing the positions of the all-Russian Communist Party. A minority faction committed to a socialist vision which was both democratic and revolutionary stormed out and formed its own organization, the Social Democratic Bund. By 1922, however, the Social Democratic Bund had been declared illegal by the Bolshevik government, and those who had been its leaders were hounded out of the political arena, and in some cases, executed while being held captive by the Soviet regime. In the newly independent state of Poland, on the other hand, the Bund flowered in the interwar era. It had enormous influence at that time within the Polish-Jewish trade union movement. It helped to establish a network of secular Jewish day schools in which Yiddish was the language of instruction, and it fostered a constellation of organizations, including Bundist-oriented movements for children, for youth, and for women. Tens of thousands of Polish Jewish workers took courses, attended lectures, or participated in other cultural activities conducted under Bundist auspices. During the 1930s, the Bund's popularity and reach notably increased. By the end of that decade, Bundist candidates were regularly winning massive victories in Polish municipal elections and in Jewish communal elections. When in 1936, the Bund called on Jewish workers to participate in a general strike, the Jewish areas of major Polish cities were shut tight. In Warsaw, Poland's largest city and the city with the largest Jewish population, the Bundist-dominated slate won 17 of the 20 Jewish seats in the last pre-war municipal elections. The Bund had comparable victories in cities like Łódź and Białystok and Vilna and Grodno. The invasion of Western Poland by Germany and of Eastern Poland by the USSR put an end to that era. Though a handful of Bundist leaders ultimately succeeded in escaping this death trap, many died or were killed while in Nazi or Soviet-occupied regions. To be sure, Bundists played prominent, heroic roles in the resistance. Virtually all of the rank and file supporters of the Bund, however, both those who fought with arms and those who didn't, ultimately suffered the fate of Polish Jewry as a whole. Surviving Bundists fostered Bundist organizations in many lands in the post-war years. Only a few of those organizations, however, succeeded in sustaining themselves as the generation of survivors died out. But the ideas of the Bund, or at least some of them, live on. So I turn to my second question. What did the Bund stand for? The Bund was, first and foremost, a socialist movement, rooted in the Marxist tradition and it sought to dramatically alter and improve political and economic conditions for all in every country in which it operated, arm in arm with socialists from the other nations amongst whom the Bundists lived. The Bund at one and the same time defended the legitimate rights of Jews in the countries in which it was active, combated political anti-Semitism, and committed itself in the first years of the 20th century to a program of national cultural autonomy or Russian Jewry that is controlled by the Jews of their own cultural and educational affairs. Because Yiddish was the language of the overwhelming bulk of Jews in Russia and Poland, the Bund ultimately became an advocate and promoter of secular Yiddish culture. The Bundists did not promote Yiddish in and for <coughs> itself, but they vigorously promoted the rights of Yiddish speakers because Yiddish was the language of the Jewish working masses in Eastern Europe. And from the Bundist perspective, the language of these masses deserved to be treated with respect and dignity 
every bit as much as did the languages of the other nations of the world. The Bund, in other words, developed an explicitly diaspora-oriented perspective. It advocated what has become known as Doikite, the doctrine that Jewish socialists should be focused on the work that needs to be done here and now. This doctrine helps to explain why the Bund argued that Zionism was a reactionary, a bourgeois-dominated, and a utopian orientation. Because from its perspective, the Zionist movement diverted desperately needed time and resources from the socialist efforts to improve conditions for Jews in the countries in which the Bund was active. I would note finally that the leading Bundists accepted the Marxist critique of religion and actively opposed clericalism. They were clearly and explicitly Jewish, but were also manifestly secular in their beliefs and lifestyle. And with this all too brief summary in mind, we come to the third question at hand. Do elements of the Bundist worldview retain meaning for contemporary activists? The key question which has been posed to the members of our panel is, has Bundism influenced your politics, and if so, how? So we take it from the top. I've asserted that the Bundists were first and foremost socialists, and that they actively sought allies from among the non-Jewish peoples along whom they lived. After decades of being consigned by its opponents to the dustbin of history, Socialism is once again on the agenda in this country. The Democratic Socialists of America, DSA, an organization which had some 6,000 members in 2015, has considerably more than 50,000 members at this time. The last figure I saw was 56,000. And the bulk of those who have entered the organization in the last couple of years are young people. I, for one, would very much like to know, what do those on this panel make of the rise of Bernie, of AOC, and of the DSA? Do they consider themselves to be socialists? And if so, are they influenced by the Bundist understanding of that term? Secondly, not only socialism, but also Darkheit has re-entered the realm of political discourse. Last month, an article in the New York Times, without mentioning the Bund, explicitly declared Darkheit to be, I'm quoting the Times, a central value for much of left-wing Jewish culture, end quote. And it also quoted the executive director of Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, I think that that director is here right now, <laughs> as proclaiming where we are is our home. This, as some of you may know, was a rather famous Bundist slogan, Dorten wo wir leben, dort is unser Land. And this leads me to hope that our panelists might be willing to address the question of their orientation towards Darkheit, towards Zionism, and towards Israel. Third, Yiddish no longer plays the role in Jewish life which it played in pre-war Poland. Personally, I can't change my language the way I could change my shirt. I'll continue to sing my song in Yiddish, but I'm eager to hear from others. What role, if any, does Yiddish play in your life and political identity? What are the current trends in the arts and literature and music that are meaningful to contemporary progressive Jewish activists? And how, if at all, are they influenced by Bundist traditions in those realms? And then finally, I've already attempted to explain that the Bundist leaders were secularists. I would be curious to learn about our panelists' relationship to Judaism or the Jewish religious tradition. Can one accept the mantle of being a Bundist or a neo-Bundist while also practicing Judaism? This, I think, gives us a great deal to talk about, but we have only a short time in which to do so and in truth, I don't really think we're going to be able to get to all of these issues. And of course, each panelist is free to answer my questions or not as she or he sees fit. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce our panelists in the order in which 
They're speaking. Jenny Romaine. Jenny, raise your hand. <laughs> Jenny is co-founder of the visual theater collective Great Small Works. She's music director of Jennifer Miller's Circus Amok and was a sound archivist at the Evo for 13 years. Yeah. Her projects include The Circus Mob, featured in the film Punk Jews, Pulem Spielen with the Aftzalachis Spectacle Committee, the revival of the Uzda Gravediggers, and Muntergang and other cheerful downfalls with great small works. Jenny was the first recipient of the Adrian Cooper Award for Dreaming in Yiddish. She received a Marshall Meyer Risk Taker Award from Jews for Racial and Economic Justice and is featured in Dazzle Camouflage Spectacular Theatrical Strategies for Resistance and Resilience. She's currently a visiting professor at the Pratt Institute. Molly Crabapple. Molly, please raise your hand. Yay. <laughs> is an artist and writer. She's the author of two books, Drawing Blood and with Marwan Hisham, Brothers of the Gun. Her work has been published in the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, the Paris Review, Vanity Fair, The Guardian, Rolling Stone, and elsewhere. She has been the recipient of a Yale Pointer Fellowship, a front page award. She was shortlisted for a frontline print journalism award and longlisted for a national book award. She has appeared on All In with Chris Hayes, Amanpour, NPR, and BBC News. Her art is in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the United States Library of Congress, and the New York Historical Society. She recently concluded a stay as artist in residence at NYU's Kevorkian Center for Near Eastern Studies. Okay. Irena Klepfish. Woo! <laughs> Irka, who was raised by Bundist Holocaust survivors and absorbed Bundist ideology by eavesdropping on their conversations about Jewish life and activism in interwar Poland. She is the author of A Few Words in the Mother Tongue and of Dreams of an Insomniac, and she recently co-edited with Daniel Sawyer, The Stars Bear Witness, The Jewish Labor Bund, 1897 to 2017. A bilingual edition of her poetry and prose will be published in Poland in 2020. Irka is currently a member of the Workman's Circle. Her political work has included membership in Die Wilde Chayes and in the Jewish Women's Committee to End the Occupation. Yeah. She served as executive director of New Jewish Agenda and as the New York City head of Brit Sedek. Irena taught at Barnard College for many years and also taught at the Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women. Last, not least, Jacob, please raise your hand. <laughs> Jacob Plitman is the publisher of Jewish Currents. Yeah, Before yeah. <laughs> Before relaunching Jewish Currents, Jacob served as the deputy director of J Street U, organized with refugees in Greece, and worked with undocumented students at his alma mater, UNC mm. Chapel Hill. Each of our panelists has been asked to speak for 10 minutes. Jenny, the floor is yours. Yeah, going first, my favorite thing. Hi, everybody. It's so beautiful to see you, and it's an honor to be in your presence. I see the layers of magnificence. I know some of you, and many of you I don't, but you look amazing. And just granted, but I'm just very excited that you're here, and I, I just think it's, um, it's very important that we gather together in this way. So I just want to say thank you for being here. Um, and 
I just wanted to say about practicing Judaism, it struck me as I was sitting there, it's like, how do you practice Judaism? And I always laugh and they say like, oh, she's a practicing homosexual. <laughs> and I just, I always find that term funny because it's like the idea of like practicing homosexual and practicing Jew. I'm not gonna go in deeper into that right now, but it just, I just <laughs> like to say that practice makes perfect. <laughs> um, or not. Uh, well, Irina made us all nervous to write things down. It was supposed to be a little bit more casual, and then it's like, Irina's, I'm writing down all my remarks. And it's like, ugh, if she's doing that, I'm doing that. Because she's, she's the grand dame in my eyes. So I am going to read some remarks, and then I will freestyle. When I was asked to be on this panel, the first image that popped into my mind was a show I made with an astonishing group of young folk at the Yiddish folk arts program called Klez Camp that grew out of the sound archive at YIVO in 1986. And I ask you now to picture the gold reflective curtain of the Tanz Zal of the eccentric Paramount Hotel in the Borscht Belt town of Parksville, New York. As I thought about the carpeting in the hotel hallway, in which we made our art, because things are very glamorous in those days. I, um, all the things that I learned from studying the Bund came cascading into my brain. And so I'm going to give you a little description of the project and then some of the cascade. It was Klaus Camp's Bar Bas Mitzvah year, 13th year of the program, and the Bund's 100th birthday. Most of my students were 13. So we did a show called 13 Ways of Looking at a Mitzvah, or What's a Nice Girl Like You Doing in a Show About the 100th Anniversary of the Yiddish Arab Tabun? <laughs> it asked the question, what does 100 years of radical socialist Bundes history have to do with becoming an adult in 1998? The show was a deep study of the different periods of the Bund through cultural products of the Bund. One was the story of a Bund youth martyr named Hirsch Leckert, a shoemaker from the north of Yiddishland, Vilna, who in 1902 tried to assassinate General Victor von Wall, a representative of the Tsarist emperor, as he was leaving the circus, no less. Uh, Wall had ordered public bloody beatings of the Bund members and others for participating in illegal May Day activities in 1902. Leckert's actions resulted in his public hanging. The life and death of Hirsch Leckert is the subject of popular Yiddish ballads, plays, and poetry. Another source for the show was the Bund fundraising film called Mirkum and An, or Children Must Laugh, or in English, here we come. Um, <laughs> Um, and it's about the Medem Youth Sanitarium outside of Varsha, Warsaw. The film is an amazing document of 1930s Bundist values, music, language, cinemagraphic style, fashion, and diet. Again, centered on young people. We did oral histories with the members of the theater workshop and used text from their bar and bat mitzvah speeches for the script of the show. This was a powerful cohort of young adults and a no-joke study group. Hirsch was called Anya in our show and was played by a 13-year-old Katie Rubin, who is now one of the founders of the Theater of the Oppressed NYC and Augusto Boal-based anti-violence theater policy think tank, aka major badass. The show was a Yiddish-English braiding together of narratives from the different periods of the Bund with the group's bar and bat mitzvah speeches entwined. It culminated with the 1902 public hanging of Leckert. Who are you, asks Van Wall, as he's about to murder Anya Hirsch. And she says, I'm the whole world. She says, as every performer from all the, t oh, she says this, as every performer from all the different time periods watch her die. We went on to perform the show at the YIVO Jews for Racial and Economic Justice co-produced concert and all-day conference on the legacy of the Bund in 1999. Jay Fridge, many of you know, is a doikite-inspired organization 
that's been building radical diasporous power in New York City for 30 years. Jay Fridge, with Evo, created a platform for deep study of Yiddish diasporous politics, culture, and values. That model is now being expanded. P.S., by the way, this is the public service announcement for Jay Fridge by members. This, so this Stoikite Hearness model now being expanded by members of Jay Fridge's new caucuses, which include a Jews of Color caucus, Sephardi, Mizrahi, raised poor and working class, and many more. So now, the cascade. This was a project in a Borscht Belt hotel over Christmas one year in 1998. 1998. What are the implications? And I would just say for me as an organizer and an artist, it was a show by and about youth. And it was, oh yeah, and I'll just say that for Bundes, in my understanding, youth are at the forefront of movements and always have been. And that in the Bund, the SCIF movement for young people provided language for young people to participate in the political and social and cultural lives of their communities. The movie Mirkum and An shows these young kids, who also are from a very diverse range of Jews, uh, doing direct solidarity with Polish miners, kids who are on strike. And they decide themselves how they're going to participate in direct grassroots solidarity giving money, what their, what their relationship is to other kids who are their peers in another culture. So modeling that. Jewish is, as Jewish does, pluralism. My grandfather was a Bundist in 1905 in Odessa, part of that tree, super different than the Bundist I met from the 30s. Like this range of, uh, from you know having worked at YIVO, for all those years, which was started by radical sociologists who were, as Yankel said, not necessarily practicing Jews. They were secular Jews. My grandfather, like them, would probably say, we will now not say a Shekhianu, because <laughs> they knew what it was. And, uh, but they were dedicated to housing and building and cataloging and preserving the lives of every Jew around them. So I feel like what I learned from the Bund is Jewish is as Jewish does which is a love of that um, diversity. How am I doing for time? Two minutes. Oh, excellent. Um, a web of Yiddish speaking time. I would say another thing I learned from this was the necessity of holding waves of this migration. So my own family had come over World War I. There were all these Jews who had lived many decades before that in Yiddish land, which goes, as we know, from the north in Lithuania down to the south of Odessa. It's enormous with many diverse neighbors. So studying the Bund, it's like, wait, it was in Vilna, it was in Odessa, it was in Poland. And you know, then the people I met who were Yiddish-speaking socialists in the United States um, were very influenced by anarchism. They were influenced. They read W.E.B. Du Bois. They were American. You know, they were, they were of European descent, but they really mixed with what was happening in the United States soil. So that's another thing when I think of Bundism. I think of a huge range and waves of migration and different relationships to the language. And I've got two more points here. Could go on. One minute, please. Uh, I got you. I got a great minute for you. And that's about the Zionism. Um, what, one minute. Afe <laughs> <laughs> Fus. 30 seconds or less. <laughs> no, it's good. I, and this is, this is my Bundes message, is that it. I had the privilege to be in Eastern Europe a couple years ago. And I was thinking to myself, like, was it in the water? Like, because personally for me, the Arab hatred is very anathema. It's like something that doesn't make organic sense to me at all. And I understand why other people feel it. I do not feel it. And I thought, is it something in the water? Like, why were they so flipped out in this east-west paradigm when they're already so far east? How are they getting caught up in this Orientalism? And then I go to this town in Uzda in the north of Yiddishland, near Slutsk, where the famous weavers were, and the um, Bear Training Academy of Smorgon. And there in Uzda was a cemetery. And we were shown the mass grave where the Jews of Uzda were murdered in the river, and then we were taken to a proper cemetery where there was a metseva, a monument for the Jews of the town. 
And right adjacent to this Yiddish cemetery is a Muslim Tatar cemetery. And then I start to learn, there were mosques in the Shtetlach. There were Tatars. People coexisted there. And it opened up a whole different branch. So for me, Doyakite, Dortrum 11, like if you understand where you are, really, you begin to see a whole different kind of relationship. Thank you. <laughs> Molly, you're on. Good, Jenny. Hello. Uh, so as you see, I did not prepare a speech, because as ever, I am uh, the bad kid in any crowd. Instead, this is my guide. Yeah. I came to the Boond because of my great-grandfather, Samuel Rothbart, a painter whose works I grew up surrounded by. He was a self-taught philosopher who played a violin made out of wooden window blinds. He was a moral vegetarian who went bankrupt on a no-kill chicken farm during the Depression. <laughs> he was a painter of gluttonous appetites and staggering genius. And during World War II, he decided that he would paint back into existence the murdered town that he grew up in, the town of Volkovysk. He did hundreds of watercolors of his memories. And I grew up with these watercolors, looking through them in my mother's house. And one day, I saw a watercolor that stuck out to me. It had a girl that looked like a Gibson girl, her hair all done up. She was wearing a purple dress with a corset and a bustle. It was late at night, and that girl was throwing a rock through a window. And next to her was her boyfriend who is holding a bag with more rocks. A gentleman does not allow a lady to carry her own rocks. <laughs> this was titled, Itga the Boondist Breaking Windows. And I started to look at it, and I thought, Itga, Boondist? Boondist? What's that? This question became a thread that led me to discover the Jewish socialist secular, and anti-Zionist movement that became uh, one of my obsessions over the last year. I spent, oh God, I spent all of my free time and my free money for quite a lot of time translating Yiddish documents and trying to find out the forgotten history of a movement that had once been the largest Jewish party in Poland, the home of the largest Jewish community in Eastern Europe, and eventually wrote an article on it for the New York Review of Books that went viral beyond my largest dreams and appealed to people who I never would have imagined. It's currently been translated into Arabic, and it's uh, being passed around a lot on uh, Palestinian intellectual sites. Now, when I wrote about the Bund, Something happened about two weeks later that made the article more relevant than ever, which was the massacre at the synagogue in Pittsburgh. Now, I had grown up, as I think a lot of Jewish people in America have, people who don't, you know, don't wear religious garb and don't look particularly Jewish. I thought that anti-Semitism in America, at least like in New York, had become like anti-Irish prejudice something that was a very serious matter in America, but that gradually through the years we had gotten rid of. And that massacre at that synagogue in Pittsburgh and the massacres that keep happening afterwards and the arson that keeps happening afterwards taught me in the harshest way that that was not true. And that was something that made me look at the Bund again. So I'm going to talk about some of the reasons that the Bund attracts me and some of the lessons that I think it has for the present. Marv Zuckerman, uh, the translator of Bernard Goldstein's 25 Years in the Jewish Labor Bund, described the Bund very briefly as an organization that was democratic, socialist, decent, and unafraid. And I want to take a look at some of those elements. Now, as Jack said, the Boon was a socialist organization, one that grew out of the revolutionary underworld of Russia, and one that not only um, unionized the workers of the Pale of Settlement and Poland, 
but also believed that nothing, nothing was too good for the Jewish masses. The film We're Coming or The Children Must Laugh was mentioned. However, one thing that I have to say about that film and about the Madame Sanatorium was here was a home for slum kids at risk for tuberculosis that was so beautiful and so modern that it was the envy of all of Europe. A place with you know, farms for the kids to be on, for biological, with biological museums, with a newspaper that the kids produced themselves. The Bund were not merely socialists, but they believed that nothing was too good for the working class. And they built a glittering socialist culture of Yiddish schools, of choruses, of newspapers, of lending libraries, legal and illegal, of parties that were so good that the Bundist members of the self-defense militia in Warsaw jostled to be allowed into them. But Marv mentioned something else, and this is something that's very important for us in America as the left gains more power. They were democratic and they were decent. Now, what do I mean by this? Many people in this room have read John Reed's 10 Days That Shook the World. And there is a famous moment where Trotsky says, go then to the dustbin of history. What's less remembered is who he's speaking to. He's speaking to the Bundes Rafael Abramovich, who is protesting in fury the Bolshevik seizure of power and the shelling of the Winter Palace, and who is offering to throw himself in front of the bullets, because this is a subversion of proletarian democracy and a betrayal of the revolution. The Bundists believed in ethics more than power. And I do have to note that while Trotsky did say, go then, you Bundists, go then, you Mensheviki, to the dustbin of history, history's dustbin is wide, and many people end up in it, including the speaker. Now, unafraid, unafraid is the last thing that I want to speak about. The Bund was an organization that from 1903, in the shadow of the Kishniev pogrom, one of the most devastating and devastatingly remembered pogroms in Jewish history, formed armed self-defense squads. They rejected the image of the Jew as someone who like hides in a basement and cowers, you know, the lie that was propagated by Bialik's poem, City of Slaughter. They rejected that and they said no. They said no, here where I stand is my country. And if you have a problem with it, I have a gun. Here where I stand is my country. The Bund were diasporic nationalists. They were people who found their homeland in their tongue of Yiddish, rather than in borders that are etched in blood, borders that are reinforced with walls and with exclusion. Here where I stand is my country, and home is the ground beneath my feet. This is not a vapid call for tolerance. You know, tolerance always reminds me of what you do when you're wearing a pair of heels and you have a blister. You know, you tolerate that. It's not that. It's rather a statement of fierce pride and solidarity. And it's a statement that I think is the only thing that can save us in the age of climate change. Now, I started with a story, and I'm going to end with that one. It's a story about Bernard Goldstein. Bernard Goldstein, um, I've, learned, uh, that I've learned to try to curb my vulgar American pronunciation of Yiddish. We Americans ruin everything, I know. We call him Bernard. Bernard. Bernard Goldstein? Bernard Goldstein. So this is a story from uh, 25 years in the Jewish labor bund. Now, he was the organizer of the Warsaw Self-Defense Militia and a tough union guy. It's 1939. And there has been a pogrom in the city of Dresd. It's not just a regular pogrom. The police have totally backed up the pogromists. And the Jews of the town are terrified. Bernard <coughs> sneaks into the town in disguise. He can't go in you know, looking normally. He'd be arrested. And he meets up with some comrades from the Polish Socialist Party to try to discuss how they can fight back, because they know that that pogrom is going to flare up again. And as he's walking with this comrade, um, I'm going to butcher the Polish name. I apologize for all Polish speakers here. But uh, Dombrowski, I believe, is the name. They're walking through the darkened streets, these still streets where Jews are too afraid to go outside. They're walking through the streets, and they see Sabbath candles in the window, just glowing. 
And Dombrovsky turns to Goldstein and he's like, what do those mean? Can you tell me? And Goldstein explains it to him. And he writes in his memoirs that if there is any hope to be had in this world in 1939, a world at the edge of falling into worse genocide than has ever come before, maybe since, it's them, the Jewish and the Polish socialist, walking together on those pogrom-stilled streets, thinking about how they're going to fight back under fascism and how they're going to defend each other. And that is what I think can save us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As some of you know, the historian Emmanuel Ringelblum organized and led the Oneg Shabbos project in the Warsaw Ghetto in order to document ghetto life and to record German crimes against the Jews. In the introduction to his book, Who Will Write Our History? Samuel Kassau explains why Ringelblum continued documenting even after he learned of the plans to liquidate the ghetto. Kassau writes, quote, over time, Ringelblum realized more and more clearly that the survivor identity would overshadow the pre-war past. The before would be erased by the after. As Ringelblum confronted the unfolding disaster, he fought all the harder to preserve the now and the before, to keep the a posteriori label of victim from effacing who the Jews were before the war. In a very real sense, Ringelblum saw history as an antidote to a memory of catastrophe, which however well-intentioned, would subsume what had been into what had been destroyed." End of quote. Ringelblum's prediction that after the catastrophe, many Jews would perceive themselves solely as victims came true. For many Jews, memorializing the Holocaust is a central part of their Jewish identity. And for many of them also, modern Jewish history begins in either 1939 or 1948. Though Ringel Bloom's prediction was right about some Jews, it was wrong about others. I was offered a Jewish history before 1939, which was vivid and very much alive. My community of Leben Geblibene Bundisten, survivors who are members of the Jewish Labor Bund in Poland, <coughs> remembered in great detail how the Bund raised and nurtured them. Their stories about Skiff, Zukunft, Morgenstern, Medem Sanatoria, or of the Yiddish Weltlacher Schule's secular schools and cultural programs, marches and worker strikes, fights with anti-Semites and fascists were intermingled with memories about the war and with anecdotes about their present American lives. They not only loved their Bundes life before 1939, they continued to honor the Bund's ideals. It was because of these seemingly casual conversations that I came to fully embrace the Bund socialism, socialism, Yiddish Weltlichkeit, Jewish secularism, and the principle of Dolkite, hereness, which I understood as being the right to lead a full Jewish life wherever one happened to be. I'm sure that some of you here today had similar experiences with parents and their chaverim, comrades. Though informal, this Bundist upbringing took root, and Bundism became, for some of us, the norm for Jewish life. It was only decades later, when I was in my mid-30s and became politically active and in contact with other American Jewish progressives, that I came to understand that my norm was virtually unknown. The moment of realization was complicated, for my activism began only after I'd come out as a lesbian 
and become engaged in the feminist and lesbian feminist movements of the 1970s. Unlike my parents, my greatest challenge and danger was not anti-Semitism, but homophobia, a homophobia that saturated American life, including American Jewish communities. This confrontation with Jewish homophobia occurred simultaneously with my meeting Jewish feminist progressives who shared my socialist values, but who considered secular identity as being nothing, not going to synagogue, and who were uncomfortable identifying as Jews, embarrassed either by the Hasidim or by their own middle class backgrounds, or by Israel, or by the constant focus on the Holocaust. It's probably a longer list, but I shortened it. <laughs> It was a difficult period for me discovering both that the Bund had been forgotten or erased and that its adherents were not perfect. But I continued to learn and things changed. Eventually, I rediscovered the Bund for myself. Jewish homophobia forced me to see that my doikait was not the same as that of my parents. Issues of homophobia and gender identity were unknown to them. Also, they recognized anti-Semitism, but didn't have memories of the Holocaust. They challenged the ideas of Zionism, but knew nothing of a seemingly irreconcilable conflict between Palestinians and Jews. They recognized a few other Polish minorities, but saw Jews as the largest, most visible, and probably most oppressed. And unlike American Jews today, Polish Bundes during the 30s were just beginning to experience political success. Their views on Weltlichkeit, secular identity, were also different. In those first three decades in Poland, a system of secular Yiddish schools had developed alongside Yiddish libraries and theaters, Yiddish newspapers and publishing houses, a thriving Yiddish culture. Much of this also existed in the United States, but after the war, it was fading quickly. Like Bundes before me, I accepted Yiddish culture as my legacy, while paradoxically becoming fully rooted in the enemy language, English. Yet despite all these differences and contradictions, I continued to feel a direct connection to the Bund of that generation. So here is what I have taken from Bundism. One, Ingerango in struggle. In interwar Poland, Bundes criticized other Jews and didn't worry about being called anti-Semites. Bundes, <laughs> <laughs> Bundes unhesitatingly challenged Zionists, rabbis, and Jewish factory owners. They acknowledged the existence of criminal elements in Jewish society, and weren't romantic about Jews. They identified what was wrong, diagnosed what was needed, and worked towards improving Jewish life. And they were never ashamed. As much as Bundes memorialized heroes and martyrs of the war, they also talked and argued openly about the role of Judenrats and of Jewish policemen. The Bund taught me not to be afraid to admit publicly to Jewish problems. The Bundes commitment to free discussion guided all my Middle East peace work. Two, Weltlichkeit, secular identity. The Bund's confidence stemmed from its belief that secularism isn't just assimilation or not going to the synagogue. Weltlichkeit included building Jewish life by establishing Jewish education and fostering Jewish culture. I was taught that one couldn't just be against something, one had to be for something. One of the destructive effects of our focus on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, <coughs> conflict is that it has sapped energy away from solidifying Jewish life here in the States. <coughs> I struggled with my Middle East activism because it limited my Bundes commitment to pass on Yiddish women's history and culture through my writing, translations, and teaching. Doikite, here -ness. 
Unlike the Polish Bund of the 30s, today we recognize Jewish multiculturalism and know that there are different ways of expressing one's secular identity. And this is important, for Darkheit is not simply anti-Zionism. It is also about expressing Jewish identity, a refusal to just blend in, and insistent on remaining and being fully, and I emphasize fully Jewish, wherever Jews happen to be. Like earlier Bundes, I see Darkheit as entwined with strengthening our Jewish identity and committing ourselves to a Jewish future in our chosen environments. There are other Bundist principles that motivated me, such as looking to the margins, to those who are invisible, who seem to exist on paper only, the single mother struggling to feed her children, the incarcerated woman who never had any options, or the Bund's emphasis on memory and history, so that as Jews we know our various heritages, know who we are and where we came from, understanding that history binds us as a people. These Bundist principles have always been an integral part of my life and work. Over the last four decades, I've worked with a variety of groups and organizations. Most recently, I've joined the board of the Workman's Circle, which was founded in the early 1900s and was strongly influenced by its Bundist members. My own Yiddish education began in the Bronx Arbeitering and Workman's Circle Schule and later Middle Shul. Today, Workman's Circle is actively engaged with all the social issues that progressives support, and it also serves as a leader in Yiddish and Jewish education, thereby fostering secular Jewish identity. It seems an appropriate plug to close this presentation with. So I invite you to join us, and as Bundist always said, in, str in struggle, in Gewangel. Thank you. Formal speaker. Jacob, you're on. All right. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, I'm Jacob. Uh, very, very excited to be here uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one reason is, you know, YIVO houses the papers of many amazing uh, writers, thinkers, and organizers from the Jewish past, uh, along with AJHS and the other organizations in this building. Morris Shappies, who was the first editor of Jewish Currents, uh, his papers are up in a bunch of boxes in a refrigerated room a couple of floors above, um, which is A, a really cool resource uh, if you want to read, if you want to read uh, his letters when he was uh, uh, sent to prison during a red baiting that happened here in New York. And also it's a cautionary tale that if you're Jewish and you do anything too important, Yivo will take your personal documents and put them in a box um, where anyone can go and read them and there's some wild stuff in there. Um, <laughs> A lot of personal letters are in there. Uh, um, so be careful. Um, I'm from North Carolina. I want to try to answer the question of what the Bund has meant to me. Mm. Um, and it's meant a lot of different things. And I, I think I'm closest to the neo-Bundist in Spencer's, uh, sounds very official in a sense, a neo-Bundist. Uh, in Spencer's formulation. And I mean, for me, I, I had a sort of different upbringing than I think other, some other folks on the Jewish left. Um, I, being from North Carolina, uh, there's a Ku Klux Klan uh, hotline, which some people may know about. The hotline has the same area code as my cell phone number. Uh, they're in a town a few miles north of where I live. Uh, there was never anything violent or extreme that happened to, to my family, but there was a sort of pervasive attitude of, of anti-Semitism. I was also homeschooled, which is a topic of a different lecture, mm. uh, uh, and, and, much, and much psychotherapy. Um, uh, but it involved talking to my, my, my would-be classmates um, about what Judaism was. And in many ways, in every interaction I ever had, I was the ambassador of Jews and Jewishness. I was almost always the only Jew anyone had ever met. And often there was the most uh, open-hearted questions about, like, uh, Jacob, do you I was like, it's the horns. And they're, no, they're not real. <laughs> um, but thank you for asking. Uh, <laughs> this made the summer camp that I was going to every year feel all the more important to me. Because camp was this place where I could go and be sequestered in the Appalachian Mountains uh, amongst this community of other Yidden. Um, and it was there that the sort of sense of 
of attack from the outside world that I was feeling at home uh, was sort of washed away. And instead, what I got was a very empowering form of uh, American Jewish political Zionism. Uh, I went to Camp Judea in Hendersonville, North Carolina. <laughs> I went there for 10 years. Um, I learned a lot of things at camp. Uh, I learned what family and community feel like. Um, I also learned what pizzazda means. Pizzazda, so some people know, pizzazda is what is yelled when a grenade is thrown into a bunker, and you're supposed to jump down on the ground. Uh, we would do this activity at camp. Somebody yelled pizzazda with a smile, like when your grenade comes and you smile. Uh, and then you would, you would jump on the ground and cross your legs. And the point was to protect yourself from this imaginary explosion and also to protect your ability to procreate. <laughs> that, and in many ways, this was woven in with the joyous daily activities and the gaga, and, uh, and in many ways formed my relationship to Judaism, Jewishness, protection, strength, uh, peoplehood. And these things were all completely woven into one for me, so that when I went back home and someone could ask me, uh, you know, you're a Jew, are you a Jew? you're a Jew, so does that mean you're, you're also an American? I had an answer actually for them, and the, and the answer was no. <laughs> the answer was no. That's actually how I felt. Uh, when, it, when it was my SAT, I wrote non-white on my SAT test. Because this is the way that I felt inside my context. This, like many people, I think many young Jews, this feeling of the Israel centricity of my entire life and Jewish uh, uh, being was shattered upon the encounter with Palestinians. Uh, it took only one conversation for this to start to erode after years and years of being in camp. It happened when I was on a gap year in the same uh, program, and I went to Bethlehem as a joke with my friend, just because we weren't allowed to go. Uh, we went, uh, we ended up meeting some activists that were there, and we thought it would be funny if we went on a couple of these lefty, self-hating tours. And on those tours, I met uh, an older couple who had survived something they called the Nakba, uh, and a word I'd never heard. And I heard a story that was reminiscent of my own family story, uh, of fleeing and of danger um, and eventually of resilience inside this camp that they've been living in in Bethlehem for generations. So the Bund in many ways, I think for many, I mean, of course, this sort of experience has fueled multiple movements inside the Jewish community who are battling for what the right attitude towards Israel is from the perspective of a diaspora progressive Jew. Um, the Bund, when one has these experiences, the interest in it makes a lot of sense, because what the Bund does is it offers a different history. It, it provides what a friend of mine called uh, an answer to the sense of orphanness that a lot of Jewish lefties have, that we have no yichis, you know, and that, that we basically, I went to camp and then I, I abandoned my community, basically out into the desert of, of leftism. And the Bund, in many ways, actually has an answer for that. And that's, that's actually been profoundly important to me for the past few years and in my work with, with Jewish currents. Um, so part of what I think is fueling this interest in me, and I think there are folks in the audience I know feel the same way, um, is the crisis of Zionism. That that is part of what's pouring fuel on this curiosity about Jewish leftism, socialism, revolution, et cetera. Um, the other half, of course, is that uh, Israel is not the only place in crisis. We have our own crisis here at home. Uh, and for many, the Trump era exposed the violence that was, in a, for some, for some, long hid under, hidden under the surface. And I think for many of us, maybe an embarrassing number of us, uh, gone is the illusion that the state, or that any state, is our salvation. And this will be equally true no matter who the next president or prime minister is. These dual crises, the crisis of Zionism and the crisis of American capitalism, and I know that sounds crazy. To, well, I know that doesn't, it isn't crazy, unfortunately. Um, but in, in terms of the idea of capitalism having failed Jews, I know that that's a, that's a fraught conversation. I think it's very important to recognize that we are, we are under the exact same pressures of downward mobility and deindustrialization and deunionization and oppression as other folks. I think there are some myths we have about ourselves and our sort of uh, inherent class uplift, which is certainly not true for working class Jews and not true for many Jews in general. Um, but these two crises, the crisis of Zionism 
in the crisis of American capitalism, that's what's framing this predicament. That for me is why the Bund is interesting, because I, I don't have, my parents do not have an answer for what to do about these two problems. They don't know, there's not like a political paradigm. What, are they, what is my dad gonna talk to me about? I mean, he's like, oh, well, I was a resident in New York in the 80s, that was crazy, you know? <laughs> uh, that was crazy. Uh, it's also not the collapse of the climate, which is what's happening right now. Um, and so the Bund, in a sense, offers the stakes, uh, uh, the stakes of it are, are sort of through the roof, in a certain sense, in a way that I think for those of us that feel panicked by what's happening right now, in a very earnest way, uh, actually feel com in, a, in a weird way comforted by, because it makes you feel not crazy uh, in thinking that there's something very, very seriously wrong uh, in what's going on inside of our politics. Um, of course, uh, while we want to celebrate the Bund, it's important that we don't romanticize it. I feel sort of strongly about that. Um, Bernard Goldstein, he's been brought up so many times, love his book. I, I can just kind of imagine him laughing about the idea of people being nostalgic about like cesspits and, and slaughterhouses and stuff that he was organizing in. And I think there's something really important about not engaging in like a workerism, as if there's something inherently glorious about being an oppressed worker in Poland, which I think I didn't never knew him, but from reading the book, I think he'd be the first to tell you that it was not a pleasant place to be. And more importantly, if we're thinking <laughs> about that, it means we are not examining our own conditions right now, which are both similar in frightening ways to that of the Bund uh, in, the, in the 20s and 30s, and also remarkably different. Imagine Bernard seeing this room. <laughs> I mean, it's very different than the, than a, than the union halls that, that sort of provide the backdrop of that work. So I, I think that, that's the second thing is like, I wanna move, I wanna push a little bit on the nostalgic, the nostalgia and, and romanticism and, and take from the Bund what I think they would wanna offer us and what I feel them offering to me, which is actually the, a hard-nosed materialist politics. Mm -hmm. and, and to really think about what it means, what, what we have to do in order to win justice, to win doikite, not just as a way of, of feeling and being, but also what would it mean to build a world, a world that is based uh, on Doikite and how we would be safer and, and better off for it. So I want to close uh, in his magisterial 1979 work, Jews in the Left, historian Arthur Liebman wrote the following. At some time in the not too distant future, the elements necessary to produce a new and reinvigorated Jewish commitment to socialism will fall into place. A decline in socioeconomic circumstances in combination with a living radical tradition will constitute those necessary elements. The elements are here. The question is, who now will step forward? Thank you. Wow. This is, this is, this is quite Javert in France, as a group. This is quite a moment, this is quite an event. There are hundreds of people here. My understanding is that there was a considerable number of additional people who registered or attempted to register. I do not know whether there are people sitting out there in the lobby as, as well, but I know that seats were put up since there was some chance that there would be a lot of people unable to get into the hall. That's striking, that's worth noting, and I think that it's important because there's a question that I want to pose to the panel. I want to have some dialogue amongst us, and then I'm going to open it up to everybody else. But the, the first question that I want to pose, first part of the dialogue is, what is it about this moment that is making this subject so significant to so many people from different generations. There's people here in a pretty wide age range, and that's terrific. I could throw out three words, okay? There are words that were mentioned in passing by some. They were discussed to some extent by, by Jacob, directly or, or indirectly. But what I want to hear is what you think about this. I would suggest that part of what is going on here revolves around a need, a desire, a want to respond to three phenomena. Trump, BB, Charlottesville. 
And I think that there are a lot of people who are searching for models of resistance. How do we get out of this mess? And what is it that the Bund did in order to confront some comparable, to some degree, crises in an earlier generation? So I'd like to hear from all of you on this. First, do you agree that what is sparking this is current events? If not, how do you explain that there's hundreds of people here, some of whom grew up in Bundist homes and others of whom did not? I'm open to anybody, everybody who wants uh, to chat. Uh, yeah, you nailed it, Jack. For me, one of um, the things that the Boon does is it presents a model of how um, a persecuted minority can try to save themselves. And there are general like, different ways right, that when a group is persecuted, they can respond to it. Uh, one way is they can try to efface everything about themselves. They can try to assimilate, make themselves invisible or respectable, you know, just dissolve themselves into the dominant culture. It's obviously an inadequate option. Another thing is they can form a separatist movement. Uh, this is you know, not, sim not merely um, something that Zionists did. It's something that various strands of black radicalism did. And it's another thing that can be very appealing when it seems like the dominant culture wants nothing but to murder you. What the Boone did and what draws me to them is they tried something different, which was a combination of a fierce celebration of their Jewishness, of their full Jewish lives with a commitment to fight in solidarity with other persecuted people. For instance, Polish workers back in Poland. And I say this not to romanticize them or say that they were perfect or to think you know, how, how nice it would be to be tanning leather you know, uh, right now. But I think that there is a principle there that, assimilation, that this sort of assimilation, this sort of um, self-negation does not work and it leaves people feeling empty, but that Separatism, and especially the drawing of new states built on ethnic lines, is something that will lead to unending war. So you need a third way, a way that allows you to never give up who you are while also fighting in solidarity with others for a better and more beautiful world. Other responses? Amen. Go for it. Oh, I said amen. <laughs> but I want to hear Come more. On. Tell me about it, if you would. Tell us about it. Well, I mean, I completely agree with what with what Molly just said. Um, I would add one other, your reasons were Trump, BB, Charlottesville, right? Okay, so I, I, would add an, I would add one more, which is uh, raise your hand if you are downwardly mobile. <laughs> and if this was a different room, honestly, if this was a different room, more reflective potentially of, of, this, of the city um, and of the country, there would be a, higher, a, a much higher proportion of hands. So that, that to me, I mean, in the Bundes, I think we're really straightforward about how that fact leads to the other three facts. How economic deprivation, privation, oppression, et cetera, leads to fascism, wherever that is happening. And I think they were clear about where it was leading to, uh, in many ways, uh, where it was leading in Europe. And I think they saw I think they saw something in, in what could occur inside a, a Jewish state as much as any other place. I mean, Henrik Ehrlich, he basically predicted that. He said, if you create a Jewish state, this is in his letter to uh, Simon Dubnov, his, the great historian who is his father-in-law. He said that it will be perpetually uh, besieged by enemies, from, uh, Arabs, Arab states from without, the Arab minority from within, and that this will just create more and more chauvinism and just create a highly militarized state where democracy will not ever flourish. And if Robin wasn't assassinated, what did you think she said? No, Robin breaks the law. I, I would love to engage in a dialogue with all of you, and I'm hoping that we can do this in a respectful manner. So how about if we just end this portion of the okay, evening Rina. first, and then I have every intention of opening this up to everybody in the audience and giving you a chance to, to say your piece. Is mm -hmm. there anybody on the panel who wants to respond to that first prompt? Yeah, yeah just briefly, I have to say, I, I, 
I really think that it's connected to Trump, but I also think it's really centered in Israel because I think we've reached a point with Israel that we never, I mean, we never thought we'd reach. And I think, you know, what I talked about, the whole issue of the accusation of how you approach Israel, and if you don't have the right line, you're an, an anti-Semite and a self-hating Jew, I think the Bund gives the opportunity of being very centered and very rooted in Jewish identity and being Jewish and still providing that kind of critique. And I think people are desperate about what to do about Israel and that they never thought it would get this far. And it's getting further and further and further from, you know, in terms of how you absolutely, how you can defend it. And I think that that's part of it. And Trump, of course, has totally, I think, exacerbated and intensified what's happened over there. I mean, his alliance with Netanyahu, I mean, it's all of that is, is sort of bound together. But I think that's also very, I think it's central to the attraction of the Bund for American Jews who are very wrapped up with Israel. So let's talk about Israel. <laughs> A few words by, by way of introduction. Um, in the remarks I made at the very beginning of this uh, evening, I talked about the Bund's attitude towards Zionism. I never mentioned <clears throat> Israel at all. I never mentioned the Jewish community of Palestine before the um, uh, independence of the state. And perhaps this would be a moment to talk about what the Bund said about Israel as distinguished from what it said about Zionism and the degree to which you, it does or does not resonate with you and, and with you. In the period immediately before the beginning of the Second World War, the Bund in Poland actually thought as if it had won on the Jewish street. I mentioned the massive victories that it was achieving in municipal elections and in Kahila elections. I, I mentioned how large was its reach in the trade union uh, movement and elsewhere. And one result of the sense amongst the Bundists that they had won was that they thought that they could um, adapt some of the things that they had earlier said. Um, there were key leaders in the Bund who visited Palestine, who visited the Yeshuv, and reported in the Bundes press on what they were finding. They were very, very critical. But in the period immediately before the beginning of the war, the Bund began to distinguish between Zionism, which it opposed hook, line, and sinker for some of the reasons that I've suggested and for other reasons that we can talk about, and the legitimate rights of the Jewish community in Palestine, the Yeshuv. They thought that, look, there are Jews that live there, and the Jews have a right to live there, just as Jews have a right to live elsewhere. And they were perfectly prepared to defend those rights. And in the post-war period, the relatively modest number of surviving uh, uh, Bundists had to cope with the fact that an independent state had been declared. They weren't in favor of it, but it had happened. And some of their friends, some of their family members had moved there. And in any event, there was a large Jewish community. And they underwent a, a process over a period of, of years in the late 40s, in the 1950s, in the 60s, and in the early 1970s, when there were still modest numbers of, of Bundists alive. And they moved from what I would call uh, advocacy of a, a binational state to openness to other positions. There were a fair number of uh, Bundists in the latter part of this period who began to talk about a two-state solution, not because it was their first choice, but because they thought that that would be the interim step to obtaining peace. And they continued to say, we oppose Zionism. We oppose the role that Zionists play in the diaspora. We oppose the ways in which Zionism undermines and belittles Yiddish culture. We oppose the emphasis on Aliyah. 
we oppose the notion that Israel should be central in Jewish life. There are other Jewish communities that have important needs. But they also began to say, we, we are not rigid, we're not set in stone. We have to adapt, we have to take into account political circumstances. And what that meant for them was openness to other solutions and, and possibilities. So I'm going to turn to the panel again. You know, when, when I hear Bibi, as I'm sure you all heard him this week, I get the distinct sense that he has put some additional final nails in the coffin of the two-state solution. I'm deeply, deeply worried and, and troubled. So what I want to hear from all of you is ideas. Where do we go from here? I want to distinguish. No, I'm quite, I'm quite serious, because this is a serious moment and a, a deadly serious issue. Let's leave aside for a moment the question of Zionism, and let's talk about Israel. What's your proposal for how? Hey, we're entitled to talk, right? What's your proposal? What do we do next? How do we do it? Questions, answers, possibilities. Am I going to fall on the sword with this one? OK. Um, I personally uh, believe in uh, one secular democratic state where every person in it is treated as an equal citizen and has an equal vote. And I believe in the right of return for refugees. And incidentally, I would say that in 1948, after Israel was founded, those demands, the right of return for refugees and um, you know, a state with equal rights for all, those demands, which are the basic demands of the BDS movement, were also the Boone's demands for Israel. Okay. Other ideas, other reactions? If not, this is probably a good moment for us to open this conversation to all of you, not only on that issue, though I suspect <laughs> that that is a live question for many people sitting here. If there are people who have questions, come up to the mic, Michael. The mic came to me. Sei sehr gut, stay off a minute. Stay off, oi. Oi, Megler. Oi, stay. Okay. Professor Michael Steinbach. So this is kind of a, a personal question, too. Um, for quite some time, you know, I've, uh, I stopped identifying as a Zionist, and I, I've identified as a diaspora nationalist. And in this day and age now, you know, and diaspora and nationalist, nationalist and diaspora, and I kind of, it seemed like a reasonable thing. And in the last few years, in the era of Trump and BB and everything else, that's going on in our world, I question, I question whether any kind of nationalism, even using that word to, to define ourselves, albeit diaspora nationalism, um, can stand up, can, can hold together. So I, I just want, you know, the, those two things are, are, they're very tricky, you know, you can talk and talk about it. Very, very tricky stuff, you know? So um, what does it mean to be a, I mean, be a proud Jew, yeah, but, and there's always yeah, but, you know, and, and so that yeah, but is what I'd like to, you know, get a panelist to maybe, I mean, uh, you know, it's like uh, deconstructing diaspora nationalism, you know? I don't need the mic, Michael, thank you. I'm going to respond and we're going to turn back to the questions in a second. The Bund rejected the label diaspora nationalist. The Bund the Bund insisted that it was not a nationalist organization. It insisted that it was nationally conscious and that that was something different. It insisted that nationalism of any kind and all kinds, including Jewish nationalism, was reactionary, and it was opposed to it. Why don't you stand up over there? I think that, that there's now a line. Is, is that... To you... clarify, if you have a question, we'll come to you. Please make sure you have a simple question in mind and not a comment. And also, if you're not sure, if you're the kind of person who should ask a question, 
this is the time to ask a question. So there's a, there's a questioner right here. Uh, first of all, um, I'm a proud, oh, okay. Um, I'm a proud socialist. I'm a proud Zionist also. Um, and it kind of, I remember, I think it was Jake who was talking about different types of Bundism. There are different types of um, Zionism. There are different types of Zionism. Um, like this? It's not on. No, it's not on. I'm sorry. I do apologize. Um, there, are different, there are different forms, different definitions of Zionism, and what it means to different people, the same way with Bund. I want to say one thing. I think the Zionist um, um, understanding of what was happening pre-World War II to the Jewish community was much more right on than the Bundists were. Okay. However, however, I think today what Bundism talks about in many ways um, resonates more and probably um, is more not just attractive but relevant to solving some of the Jewish issues today. So I really don't think necessarily it has to be one or another. And I'm not going to try to convince you to be a pro-Zionist. That's not it. I really wanted to come up to say that there's so many things that are happening in the world that as a Jewish community we have to find common ground. So just as a quick example. Um, I'm Sorry, a sir, if you could just ask a simple question. Sure, I will make it, a, we, I will make it very react? simple. That's very interesting. How is everybody today? <laughs> Thank you very much. It won't be simple. Okay. Uh, oh God, he wants to make this Go for it. Yeah, okay. exactly um, I just want to say two, two quick things. First, to your, to your point about, about nationalism. Um, there's a ton of debate inside Jewish history, and I'm, I probably don't have to tell this to that many people at a, a YIVO audience, <laughs> that there's a lot of debate uh, in Jewish history as to what Jews are, uh, whether we're a, a nation, uh, a, you could have the Mordecai Liebling, civilization, a people, etc. To me, what's, what's most interesting about this conversation is actually the paucity, the, the almost total lack of forums uh, to even have this debate in a serious way with stakes. I think it's notable that people, hundreds of people will come to an event uh, about the Bund, but let's say we wanted to all go vote on whether, which of these words we think describes what Jews are, where would you go? <laughs> there are no democratic institutions inside the, the Jewish community. Uh, the community is by and large run by, uh, by a, a donor class, which is the same antagonism that's inside. <laughs> I should add, like every other community is run is run by uh, you know our own our own sort of a uh, you know pet oligarchy. Um, so I want to I want I bring that up because I want to respond to this idea of different Zionisms and the idea that Zionism may have been, had a better or worse diagnosis of a, a, a previous area and Bundism has more to say today. Fine, fine. I think that that's the debate that we should have in in YIVO. That's the YIVO debate. And I think it's important because what's ha in this space, what happens is we end up litigating these political questions that I think we're actually reflecting on a desire for a political space where we could decide such things. A historical debate on Zionism is something really, really important, but I think the ferocity around that question and the idea that there might actually be a, a position that, that is sort of like Zionism worked in certain circumstances before, I can certainly understand why a Bundist, even a hardcore socialist, anti-nationalist Bundist would flee the Nazis to Palestine. I mean, anybody that can't understand that, I think, is just being completely close-hearted in, in a certain sense. Um, but I, I want to put that out there where I think there are some debates, and, and I don't think we're going to be able to litigate them here on this stage. Um, but I think it is, to me, in a sense, the answer around these questions of uh, uh, these sort of like base political ones actually beggar um, uh, the, the lack of such a forum and the inability, the, the lack of organization that we have uh, as compared to the Bundists that we sort of admire and are drawing from. Hi. Um, I, I wanted to know if you knew of a, a book called um, The Lion's Den by uh, Susie Linfeld. I saw her interviewed on Ro Robert Shearer, by Robert Shearer um, on a truthdig.com web website. And um, if you haven't heard of it, I wanted to recommend it. And, and um, Ms. Krabs, Krabapple, there was something you said that um, about uh, a secular one state that that she talks about the different uh, writers on Zionism uh, in the course of the 20th century. Um, she addresses that and 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 um, a sort of a worldwide historical view of how that has been um, how how different writers have addressed it. So I was wondering if you've heard about it, 
of that book? I, I sadly haven't, but um, I'm gonna, afterwards I'm gonna probably uh, hit you up to write it down for me so I can actually uh, buy a copy. Thank you. Um, I heard it, I have reviewed it. I'd be happy to give you the citation for my review. <laughs> <laughs> and if you What's want, we can name? chat about it. it. Other questions? Um, as an explicitly anti-nationalist ideology, I was wondering if anybody could speak to the ideological or historical relationship between Bundism and, and Bundist and anarchism and anarchists. And between what? Bundists and anarchists. Oh. Explicitly anti-nationalist yeah. ideology? Yeah, like, like how do Bundists, how are Bundists and anarchists? I can't hear you. It was the, the relationship between anarchists and, and, and Bundism. The, it, the question I gather, I actually didn't hear it, was on the relationship between anarchists and Bundists, in effect. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so let me say, if, if, you, if I may, I'll say a word or two about that in several different um, ways, um, if, if possible. So, so first of all, what I would say is that in the context of the Russian Empire at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, that anarchists and the Bundists represented different political ideologies. They were both anti-Tsarist, but they had very, very different approaches, both to how one ought to overthrow the Tsar and as to what ought to happen next. In the context of the Tsarist empire, the, the anarchists tended to endorse um, terrorism, that is to say, uh, individual acts of violence directed against political uh, officials as a way to bring down the system. And the Bund, Hirschleckelt to the contrary notwithstanding, tended to respond by saying, look, if you kill Governor X, he will simply be replaced by Governor Y. And that, of course, is what happened in any number of instances and the anarchist actions led to pogroms and wide-scale slaughter of innocent Jews in any number of different circumstances. That said, the Bundists and the anarchists were very much on the same side in their revolutionary struggle to make the world a better place, a different place. And they were both engaged in revolutionary cultural movements uh, in literary and in other terms that paralleled each other. Yes, uh, my question is, uh, my question is, under the current conditions existing in the West Bank and Gaza, how could there possibly be a two-state solution, given that Israel has occupied a very large chunk of what is the West Bank. The only two-state solution would be a number of Bantu stands, just like it was the case in South Africa. I think the two-state solution is gone, not by doings of the Arabs, but by doings of the Israeli government. Now, the other issue, the other question is, I th Jack mentioned that by nationalism was sort of set aside uh, by the Boone as the only solution uh, in the 50s and 60s. It seems to me that today, binationalism has a, re, a, re, a new uh, uh, vitality and a new relevance because a secular democratic state, if it's going to be democratic, can only be multinational in a place like uh, the, current, uh, uh, the current territory occupied by Israel. So number one is the two-state solution factually possible, and number two, isn't by nationalism re very relevant to the question of the, the, the secular democratic state? Would someone like to discuss I feel that? Like you haven't yeah. said Jenny? No? <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to say a few words, but I want to give other people a chance. If, if I may, I, is it okay to out you, to name my friend, Professor Sam Farber, who just so eloquently uh, spoke. How could there possibly be a two-state solution today? You know, men let with hope. One lives with hope. I, I think that it becomes 
harder and harder. I think that uh, the grade that we have to climb is steeper and steeper all the time. I have not yet given up, Sam. We're in this together, and we're still fighting. Uh, Sam, and I is, I'm sorry, Molly, is the secular democratic state the only possible alternative? No, I think not. And I was open when I said, listen, I want to hear from all of you about what other possibilities exist. You'll remember, Sam, that I talked about a binational solution, which in the eyes of, you know, Brit Shalom and Ehud and Magnus and Buber and any number of other lefty Zionist types in the 1930s and 1940s was a possible alternative. And it may well be a long-term alternative for us as well. I've got a, a button up on, on the board in, in my kitchen. Um, my, my partner and my son are sitting here and they'll, they'll know the one that, that I, I'm talking about. And, and it says something like, um, two peoples, two states, one future. And I continue to accept that as my goal as well. Sam, I tend to agree with you. And much of it comes from uh, traveling and reporting in the West Bank. At this point, I believe it's a fifth of the population of West Bank is settlers. Uh, they have you know, Jewish-only roads. They have heavily fortified hilltop compounds. Any sort of, in my view, attempt to create um, a separate Palestinian state that wasn't a sort of total land grab or Bantu stands would imply civil war with the settlers, in my opinion. Hello. Uh, 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 an observation and a question. A lot of what you're discussing took place at a time when Jewish communities all spoke the same distinct language to a great degree lived and understood each other as distinct communities. The Bund grew up at that time, so to some degree did the Jewish anarchist movements, also the Zionist movements. We're living in a very different world today in which there could be even five times as many people as are in this room and in the back and watching it elsewhere. But statistically, that's almost not a significant part of the population. And most of us are talking about individual stories rather than a collective phenomenon. So the question is, what relevance and how is Buddhism relative in a very different world? I remember, Jack, you spoke at another conference on Jews and the left. And to some degree, you're saying this movement is petered out, for lack of another expression, because of the changing nature of Jewish life. To some degree, these questions are not totally different from what happened to the forward. That is, the audience that it had turned into the children and grandchildren that there was no need or desire to look to that for answers. And my concern is that many of these distinct movements, too few people and there's no community looking to them for answers. I think you should talk to that because you're creating a lot of Take the question. <laughs> <laughs> question. Um, yeah, I feel like that's, that to me is, is kind of the, the question. I mean, It's interesting, to, it's interesting to posit that there's not a sense of need for the Bund. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, no, really, I, mean, I, 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 think, I think part of what we're experiencing in this room, uh, and this happens to, to, some, uh, to some degree on, online and in the various conversations that happen there, there is a lot of both spillover and also uh, internal interest being generated uh, in various socialist, communist, et cetera, conversations inside a, a Jewish context. And I think that's happening, again, because of the, I think there are, it's the three things that Jack said at the beginning, uh, you know, Trump, BB, and Charlottesville, you know, all his synecdoches of fascism and anti-Semitism, et cetera. But really what's underneath that is the underlying economic conditions. And, I, and the generations you're describing are the generations that had generation after generation climbing wages, right, climbing levels of structural employment, um, all the various uh, uh, benefits of sort of mid-century American life 
uh, that, that uh, turns down the heat in many ways on certain uh, progressive and leftist movements uh, and allowed for Reaganist politics, et cetera. So I think really what we're talking about when we talk about the Bund and the renewal, and I put that sort of in quotes, I mean, it's, I mean it, it could be renewed. If the Bund is around, I would love to be invited to. Uh, um, I really want to go, uh, if you can tell. Um, but, but there's this, like, it's actually like more of a sense that, that, that there's a desire, actually, for, uh, for this space and this kind of thing. And I, I think that's, that's really what's happening. And I, I, the, 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 all the differences between then and now are, are kind of like myriad. I don't even know how we could describe the difference between 1930 and today. But, but the, the scary part is, is how similar it is to describe the similarities. Uh, the similarities aren't complicated at all. Uh, we live in a golden age with, uh, with oligarchs and robber barons and deprivation and people living outside, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And th th those conditions are actually are, uh, you know, are, are as medieval as they were at that time. And I think that's why we suddenly find ourselves reaching into our past and wondering what we might bring into the future uh, with which to do it. That's what JFRAGE is doing. It's what many organizations are doing. Um, but I think what this is an expression of is that longing. Another Have you ever been frank? It's getting late. Many of us are working people. <laughs> and that means that we have to get up early tomorrow morning and go to work. Okay. I'm one of those people. So here's what I suppose. How about if we have one last question for the evening, and we continue this dialogue over a period of years? <laughs> Jack. One more. Please, you've got the mic. Go for it. Um, so uh, a book, Revolutionary Yiddishland, talks about the pronounceability or pronounceability of uh, Jewish revolutionary politics and how that's been lost, how it's hard to talk about the Bund. Um, just in the political discourse we're in. And I think tonight we talked about that a lot in terms of Zionism and how that affects the pronunciability of, of the Bund. My question for you all is how it's affected by white Jewish assimilation to whiteness, because that's not something I've heard a lot about tonight, and I feel like that really affects how we hear and understand the Bund as something that can exist. And I just want to know what are, what are your experiences or observations with how whiteness has ex affected how we look back and see the Bund? and apply it now. Yeah, I would just, I've been, um, I've been kind of quiet here because my life's work has been exactly what you just said. So for me, I don't experience all this as lack. I don't experience mm. lack. I feel like I am in a community of queer, trans, every other kind of Jew you could imagine that has been building every day of our lives in many languages to understand our histories, to unpack whiteness, and to, you know, when we were talking about this, people were talking about the Ashka normativity as, uh, you know, some people say it's separate, but I think it's very connected to the whiteness and, and a relationship to the Bund, which is that my actual experience has been that Zionism and a kind of assimilation is what that Ashka norm thing mm. is, and is actually not, not as brilliant and nuanced and diverse as what all the Yiddish stuff is. So part of the resuscitation of the Bund, which I'm like you, I don't want to do a live action role play. That's never been of interest. But it's the building and the, the risk taking of where you are being where you're from. And so what does it mean to be in that perpetual improvisation with a materialist analysis and an anti-racist analysis? Chaver and Frank, Jacob, Jenny, Molly. I was just getting Ilka. to the apotheosis of my content. <laughs> I did not mean to cut you yes, off. Yes, let me finish. I've been so Go quiet. Go for it. Jenny, finish. What I wanted to say was, what many of us have learned from our study and practice of Bundist aesthetics and politics, which, in which I blend a delicious, flavorful mix of anarchism, um, is a practice for understanding territoriality, language, subtlety, neighbors. So in Jayfridge, for example, when it first came to us about the Ashka normativity, it was like, oh! You know, it's like, oh no, that's not what I meant. And of course, 
it's about this layer of uh, bringing to the surface everybody's layer of diversity. So now what we're experiencing, like for example, in Jayfridge as a critique of whiteness is a whole investigation of all the layers of Mizrahi Sephardi culture and people coming into their own experience of it. So all this to say, my experience of Buddhism is an experience of emergence. It's an experience of culture being a driver, not only of wealth, but of power. And so what I take away from this conversation is all the politics and the imagination, and the imagination of what Jewish culture, materialist, anti-racist Jewish culture can be. A wonderful moment. Irena, Molly, Jenny, Jacob, my thanks to all of you. And my thanks to Spencer and to the Evo for putting this all together. Akuta, you, you, that was perfect. I don't know if it was perfect. I thought, I thought it was.